What is up guys? This is All The Smoke on Strength and Physique with your hosts Adam and Chris where we provide you with evidence-based information, community support, and recognition to all who are bettering themselves with fitness. On this episode, we talk All The Smoke with Brian Waddell. You know, it's Super Bowl, he's probably getting pretty litty. Pretty litty. Yeah. He's got the whole Bucks <laughs> uniform Does on. Does anyone have a drink by him? I just I <laughs> shaker. That's all I got. I can see him just going straight up Gronk before he got on here. <laughs> 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 so yeah, yeah, we appreciate you coming on. Um, why don't you tell our three listeners who you are and what you do, my man? Yeah, for sure. Um, so for the three listeners out there, uh, my name is Brian <laughs> Waddell. Um, I went to U, uh, University of South Florida. Me and Adam were actually in the same undergrad uh, program. Um, and then I went on to do my grad school at USF as well under Dr. Campbell, who was most of you, all three of you probably know at this point. Um, and did a lot of research in body composition, uh, strength training, um, some, some more of the mental aspect of, of the endurance stuff as well with uh, Dr. Kilpatrick. And uh, when I graduated, I uh, got a job with Sohili at ELT Method, and I'm now uh, head of education for the company as well as a uh, coach. So I'm a coach, and I also play. The, uh, I'm in the role of head of education. So, uh, yeah. So, um, so what type of? Because I'm more into the physique coaching. What type of coaching, or what is your main clients' goals that you like to focus on, or are you just overall wellness? Yeah, no, um, it, it kind of it varies. So it's, it's general population are my clients, I would describe them. Um, and within uh, that kind of general sector, uh, you have people that have you know, fat loss goals, strength goals. Um, some people just want to maintain, some people just want to live a healthier lifestyle. They don't have really specific body composition goals. Um, uh, so yeah, so I have anywhere, I have people who are um, ex-collegiate athletes. I have um, one of my clients uh, is a, um, I probably shouldn't say too much. She is um, a high ranking, how do I say this without giving up her position? If she told me what she, what she did for throughout the day, she would have to kill me. You know what I'm saying? One of those positions in the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, I've uh, came across those people. Next thing you know, our <laughs> pot, our podcast is shut off because yeah, right, right. Right. <laughs> yo, somebody, yeah. Hold on. yo, somebody's knocking on my door right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so yeah, so it's cool. So I work with a lot of different people, um, and uh, yeah, so you know, obviously, um, whether the the goal is body composition or strength um, or just a healthier lifestyle, the, a lot a lot of the principles apply, right? The strategy is different, but a lot of the same principles apply. Yeah, no, no, definitely. That's I was just curious. I just got my first prep client. And so that's why I was wondering uh, for your role with Elk Method. That is that is awesome. Uh, I think that's incredible. Could you explain a little bit further what that role the director of education includes or what do you have to do normally? Sure. Yeah. Um, so it's actually head of education, not director, which um, I know it might sound like a semantics thing but usually directors a little higher up <laughs> That's... Um, it's, it's usually more advanced but no it's okay yeah uh yeah so for head of education uh, my role there is um first of all so he she really um she really values continuing education for her coaches and for herself um so she spends a lot of resources uh keeping everybody up to date on the, uh, the newest research so part of what i do is uh, i keep my feelers out there keep my finger on the pulse uh what new research is coming out and so basically um when new research comes out, I forward it to the teams. And sometimes it's just a, you know, here, check this out, read this. Sometimes it's more formal where I'll, um, we'll take a topic, say strength versus hyper hypertrophy, um, pick a few papers showing the mechanisms, um, you know, maybe a meta-analysis showing kind of the broad, you know, the literature as a whole. Um, and we will actually, you know, the coaches read it, I read it, we all go over it together and kind of decide, you know, what's, what we can take away from the literature. Um, and so, yeah, so in the head of education role, it's basically just, um, keeping everybody up to date on, on research. And is this something that while you were in the program that you were considering or because I had never thought of being a head of education or a role like that for, uh, a huge coaching team. And 
I really love research and I fell in love with research, but not enough to actually do it for a living, like go to my PhD for it and et cetera. But I think what you're doing is probably like the next best step. Yeah, no, I love it. Um, so I also was a, I also taught classes in my in grad school, right? So I taught um, different exercise science labs, um, nutrition classes. And so I do like um, being an educator. Um, and I kind of fill that role as an educator. Uh, I, I, you know, provide research for us to talk about amongst the team, but I also, you're also educating clients when that you're working with. Right. Um, but yeah, so that's a good point. So, you know, I didn't um, necessarily want to keep going for my PhD. Um, I love research. I love being on top of research. Um, but this role allows me to stay on top of the research, which I don't need this role to stay on top, but it makes me um, stay on top of the research that much more than I would have had I not um, had this role the company now why don't you go ahead and do us a favor and go over your research experience because from my understanding you were involved in two maybe even three labs at usf go into a little bit of detail of what um i guess research you were a part of and what you did as a, a, a research coordinator yeah so um i was a coordinator for dr kilpatrick's lab um i coordinated uh, my own study which is still kind of in limbo because of the whole covid thing um, so we're looking at um, different motivational techniques um, on uh, aerobic performance. Um, I was also uh, a research assistant for Dr. Campbell, where that's where I did the majority of my research. Um, so I, we did um, a lot of strength training, um, high versus low um, volume on, on strength and hypertrophy. Um, we did a lot of body composition research, um, looking at different diet techniques, um, refeeds or diet breaks, however you want to call that. Um, and I also was a subject for, for quite a few uh, studies as well, mostly under Dr. Buckner. So yeah, lots of body companies, lots, lots of fat loss, muscle gain, strength gains, or no gains. A lot of stuff that you can really, the fun thing I think about USF is a lot of stuff that we research on, we can literally carry it over to our clients. Um, oh, yeah. So being in the research, like what techniques or what type of experience are you now carrying over to your clients? Yeah, so, you know, so it's there's some applicability but maybe not some as well because you know when you're when you have a, a study going on in a laboratory everything is super tightly controlled right and so what you have to in order to control all the variables so you can see you know what's working what's not working and if there is a a, a difference in whether it's you know muscle or strength you can owe it to the intervention and not some other extraneous variables um so so the research tells us, you know, here's, here's what works, right? So let's say high volume, it shows, it shows, you know, research shows high volume is best for, um, for muscle gain, let's say. Um, yes, that's true. And we have experiments. I'm just saying arbitrarily, let's say we find out this is true. We know that this works in a lab. Does it work in the real world? That's a different question, right? Because you're not, um, all those same variables are not necessarily controlled for as a coach. You try to control for those things. But especially as an online coach, you don't even actually see your client. So, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of applying the same principles, whether it's, um, you know, the, the frequency of working out or, you know, how your split is set up. Um, but yeah, so yeah, there's some carryover, but also there's a, there's kind of a stark difference between real life and, and research as well. One of the biggest things that I've came across, and that's a really good method is all of the controlled variables that that's something you can't get within a normal client. And a lot of the time you got to coach behaviors up in order to get it to that. For example, like eating a lot of protein. If they're doing research with us or they're participant in the lab uh, or with a study, they, they're they going to be committed to eating a lot of protein if that's the, the group they get stuck in. Or we're going to be like basically chucking protein at them nonstop. So that's the biggest thing that I've tried to get. Uh, but one thing I'm thankful for is just like all those variables that we were always managing and tracking. So thankful because now I do that with all my clients. And what's the biggest thing that you research, like when you were a researcher, that you take in with yourself to put it towards your clients? Yeah. So one thing I, I really recognized when I was doing the research is how each person is going to respond completely different. Right. 
you have some subjects that just completely coast right through it. They do everything perfectly, eat all the right amount of protein, calories, they work, come to every single workout. And then you have some people who don't show up. Um, they, you know, they'll give you data and it doesn't even make sense sometimes. And um, so you, you realize that there's so much variability between person to person, right? So even though, in a, and so again, going back to, you know, in a, in a research study, you have, let's say two groups, everyone's doing either this or this, right? But in the real world, there's not two groups. You're every single, every single client has a different strategy, right? Um, you go, you kind of, you, you, you know, as a practitioner, you know, what's optimal, right? But where are they now, right? If we know this is optimal, this much protein, this much exercise, but they're starting here, you don't say, hey, you're down here, let's go all the way up here. You kind of meet them somewhere in the middle, right? Somewhere between what's what's optimal and what's practical. That's where you kind of have to meet the, um, kind of find the sweet spot there. And what type of strategies? Because from what I understand, um, I, you guys are huge on habit stacking. What other type mm -hmm. of strategies, or could you even go into a little bit more detail of what habit stacking is um, that sure. you would utilize for your clients? Yeah, so habit stacking um, is, is a strategy to um, help people implement um, new behaviors uh, based, uh, kind of attach it to stuff they're already doing, right? So for instance, um, let's say I have clients that sometimes they don't drink enough water throughout the day. So instead of saying, okay, I want you to drink more water. Okay, that's, that's not very concrete. Okay, that's, okay, sure, I'll drink more water. Okay, when are they gonna drink water? Um, how much water are they gonna drink, you know? So habit stacking is, for instance, saying I'm going to fill up my tumbler full of water and drink that after I brush my teeth, right? So you, you're already brushing your teeth. That's the thing you're already doing. So habit stacking is trying to implement something new on something you're already doing. So the, the teeth brushing could be the cue for the new behavior, which is the drinking of the water. So that, that's an example of habit stacking, but that, that could be applied to many different things, whether it's, you know, eating more protein, exercising, going for a walk, like the, you, you basically attach a new behavior that you're trying to implement to something you've, you already are doing. And do, yeah. you, do you know the science behind that? Because I know it's very effective, but I just, I'm not aware of the psychological effect that it has. Um, well, whether it's a, a psychological effect, I think it's just, it just be, it, just, it ties it to something you're already doing. Right. So again, it's, it's more concrete than just saying I need to drink more water. Right. Cause, cause if you say I'm going to drink more water, the intention's good. Right. But, um, it doesn't give you something to really execute. Like it's just an idea, drink more water. But when you, when you stack it on something you're already doing, like brushing your teeth or maybe starting your day at the computer or something like that, that just, it's just a, it's a, it's a cue. You need a cue to say, Oh, that's right. This is my new behavior. I'm trying to set into place. So I brush my teeth. Now it's time to drink my water. Yeah. So again, Absolutely. nothing works for everybody, but that's just a, that seems to be an effective way for people to, to try to start implementing new behaviors. Got it. Now, so you said you work with a broad kind of population of clients. Um, I think what's started to get more and more popular nowadays is like intuitive eating or, you know, I can lose weight without tracking. Let me hear your mm -hmm. thoughts on that. Yeah. So yeah, you can, anyone can lose weight without tracking. Um, however, it depends on where someone is starting from, right? So for instance, I've been experimenting with different dieting techniques and training techniques. I can lose weight without tracking, but I've been doing this for 14 years. Um, someone who's never really adhered to an exercise plan or nutrition plan, um, can they lose weight without tracking? They can, but is that the best strategy? Uh, um, maybe, maybe not. Uh, some people, depending on where they are in their and the learning process of the whole phase, you know, maybe maybe track. Maybe they're not ready for tracking. Maybe they need to be more a little more basic, right? Like instead of saying this many calories, this much protein, and then fill in the rest with carbs and fats. Maybe people that are super beginners, um, just have them say, you know, eat, you know, three servings of protein or, or a large serving of protein with each meal, um, add in some veggies. So you're not being very specific with the numbers, um, but you're kind of getting some behaviors of, you know, uh, kind of giving a point in the right direction. And at some point, you know, once they, they start to adhere to that, um, then maybe you can start being more specific with your protein and calorie uh, recommendations. But yeah, so go back to your question. You can lose weight without tracking. Um, however, sometimes tracking is, is, is good to kind of find a baseline of where they're currently at and to give them a very you know, hard number to, to reference for whether they want to you know, increase, decrease, et cetera. Now, have you ever had a client that 
just say, just says to you, Hey, I don't want to track. And what is your approach to that other than saying, Hey, okay, well, we're going to eat X amount of protein at each meal or X amount of servings of this. Um, what is your, I guess, approach when they hit that plateau? What do you guess coaching them through that now? Yeah. So when they hit a plateau, so it really depends on like where they're at psychologically. So going back to like, I, I know what's optimal. I know what can help people lose weight or gain muscle or, you know, I know what needs to be done, but you know, if they're really struggling, then maybe maintenance is where they need to be. Um, maybe taking the reins off and not tracking for a while is a good idea. Um, because again, you don't want them to, you don't want them to hate it. Right. You don't want them to. And sometimes if people are too restricted, they end up rebounding and just completely going off the rails and just you might not hear from them again. They just kind of, you know. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. one thing I've seen with tracking is it can be so hard for some people. Mm-hmm. But something that I took from Dr. Campbell is was starting off with tracking very small first. So doing one meal doing a snack that you consistently have. So yeah, yeah. that's how I, I, I have found that to be successful, but it's so different per individual, like you've been saying. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Or even, or even like, whether it's just one meal or even just say, just track your protein, right? That's, that's very easy. Just track your protein, but in tracking your protein, again, you're, you're kind of building that behavior of searching for whether it's in my fitness power, whatever you're using, you're finding out how much protein or there's looking at the nutrition label, but just them getting good at, at tracking the protein now they have a, um, a very, you know, baseline way of searching for foods and finding out what their macro content is. Now they can start also counting calories at some point, if that's the direction you want to go. Now, what is something that you've done? Um, if you've ever had like an individual has gone through like a binge eating uh, experience or something that, right. They're super well with five days that, that, that during the week, but then on the weekends, they're just eating tons of food and they just have no self-control. What's your approach with that? Yeah. So actually I talked uh, about one of my clients recently on Instagram. Um, uh, I'm the exercise scientist, by the way, if anyone wants to look me up. Um, So she, um, awesome client. Uh, She's very much a go-getter. She has no problem sticking to her exercise uh, routine. Um, And generally speaking, she does very well with nutrition, but she had, at some point she had this, um, this kind of stress eating response going on. Uh, so back when the elections were happening, there was a lot of, you know, back and forth, people were stressed out. Um, and she kind of went off the rails and, um, just was eating lots of cake, drinking lots of wine, just completely just kind of ditching her nutrition plan. And she had mentioned to me that this was kind of like a way she had dealt with stuff in the past, right? Like she just kind of just ditches everything and just, uh, just kind of goes off the rails. Um, so with her, and by the way, she almost actually, she almost just quit coaching altogether. She's like, I just don't even want to do this, but she realized like, and I'm glad she did. She realized like, actually, no, this is when I need to coach the most. Like I need to figure out like how not to go off the rails every time something stressful happens. Um, and so for people like that, um, it's one of the things you would want to do for a client like that is kind of like to, uh, walk them through to get them to recognize, uh, like that feeling of right when it's about to happen. Right. So, and, and that's kind of the first step is they have to be cognizant that they're about to uh, start this, this bad behavior, this bad habit, right? And, they, and you kind of have to reflect on it and say, okay, so tell me how you felt leading up to that point. Okay, you know, I, well, I was stressed. Um, there was wine and cake around. I just wanted to, to go bananas, go, go berserk. Um, what that is, it's, it's, a, it's a form of self-soothing, right? So it's not the, the wine or the cake specifically that they're, they're looking for. They're looking to soothe themselves from the stress that they're experiencing. Right. And so one of the ways to get them to, instead of saying, just don't do that again, right. That doesn't work for most people. Hey, just don't drink wine and eat that cake like you did before. Right. So an easier way to, uh, to go about that is instead of just telling them to not do something as you redirect them to something else. Right. So when you get to that point, you're stressed, you know, that you have this pattern of when I'm stressed, I stress eat. So instead of stressing, what else can you do? Right. Um, and you have to kind of stop and check in with yourself, right? So for someone like, so for someone like her, so if she gets to that point again, say, okay, I know I normally stress eat, but what's a, what's a more healthier way to cope with this? Maybe go for a walk, maybe do five minutes of meditation. Um, basically do something that is, may also help soothe the stress that you're currently feeling, but also aligns with your overarching goals, your body composition goals, your strength goals, your health goals. So, so instead of saying, don't do something, 
you kind of help them build some healthier habits, redirecting that energy, to something that's more, um, more productive, more healthy. Um, and that's also conducive to their, to their goals. Yeah. That always irritated the hell out of me when coaches are right here and be like, Hey, just don't do that. Like mm -hmm. we all know not to do that, right? but right. give me some form of strategy or like, like you said, give it, give the, uh, the client some other options and then let them select and whatever, I guess, works for them. They can run mm -hmm. with it. But for you to just tell them not to do that, like, we all know it, right? She knew it multiple times. She was very aware of, hey, like, oh, she was super aware. Way. Yeah, that's the, that's yeah. a crazy thing. We all are understanding of, hey, this is our weak points. I just don't know how to right now control it. Um, and I think what a lot of clients is, I've dealt with it as well. When things go to shit, they just want to quit, and they mm -hmm. are kind of almost embarrassed to yep. talk to us. And that's like you said, this is why we're here. We're not here just for the good part. We're here for those those bad parts where we can, hey, let's solve it because. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, that's what's really killing you because, right, you're really good for five, four, six days or whatever it may be. But maybe that just one habit or that that one time frame just really just throws everything off. But once we learn able to control that, man, they just they just really succeed and flourish. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. You have to build a, a good relationship with your clients at the beginning so that they're willing to talk to you about that kind of stuff. Right. So so when she was kind of going down that spiral. I, uh, I wanted to, I wanted to jump on a, a zoom call with her. Like I don't email was not enough at that point. Right. I wanted to have some face to face. And she had mentioned down the road after that, that that was very helpful in that moment, like the face to face, right. Have that conversation. Um, yeah. And so I, I kind of lost my train of thought there. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry. I, I lost my train of thought there. I actually really like that you did that. Uh, I don't, especially with online coaching, I think it's, Sometimes it's harder for the client to be adherent sometimes because they don't have that face to face. And if for some coaches, all they do is email only and they don't do face to face, they don't do over the phone, they don't do anything. And it's harder to build a connection if someone mm -hmm. can just ignore their email. Like, mm -hmm. okay, now I feel down because I just had all this wine or whatever. And now I feel like quitting again okay, I'm just not going to look at my email because I know Brian's going to be sending an email like tomorrow because check-in. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah. So, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. The face-to-face -face is really important. Um, there's some, there's some ideas that just can't be portrayed um, via email, especially when someone's having a really hard time. Um, if they don't know you that well, you know, they, you, 10 people can read a sentence and that could be interpreted 10 different ways. Right. And so if you get them face to face, they can hear the way you're saying it and it makes it, the, the idea is getting portrayed more accurately um, and maybe uh, with more sympathy for someone that's going through something um, like, you know, an episode like that. So I think the next thing I'd like to get on you um, about is what are your thoughts um, of setting up a successful fat loss phase? Like, obviously, we were just talking about like building behaviors, but are there certain checkpoints where you're like, okay, we've developed this now we're ready. Or is it something, Hey, you come to me, you want a fat loss phase. All right, let's get it. Yeah. I would say the majority of my clients are fat loss um, oriented. They, I would say, I don't know, maybe 70% 70, 70 are looking to do fat loss. Um, and we kind of just get right into it. Um, most people are, you know, they're eager to, to, to get started. Um, where everyone starts from is different, right? Some people are brand new. Some people have done this a bunch of times before. They're just looking for some accountability. Um, so, you know, I go by what they're, you know, they sign up with what's their weight, what's their history with nutrition. And, um, you know, I, um, for the most part, I give them some, some calorie and protein goals to start. That's really like my, my favorite. Um, and so, you know, I give them their, their calorie goals. They, for the first two weeks, they're, they're sticking to it, or at least trying to stick to it. And that's really, the magic really happens after that first check-in, like the first and second check-in, right? Because if, if I go based on their body weight and what they've reported as their current nutrition, if I give them numbers and, but instead of losing weight, they actually are kind of creeping up in weight, then I know I might have to kind of recalculate those numbers, right? Um, and, but again, conversely, if I see that the weight's trending in the right direction, maybe I hit it on the money and we'll just kind of stick with it for a while and see how it goes until we hit a, a plateau. So, yeah, so for the most part, uh, when it comes to a fat loss phase, I would say, um, you know, implement the principles that we all know, you know, go, go nice and slow. Um, high protein is generally what I recommend. 
um, and just kind of monitor um, how their how their weights change. But not only weight, that's not the only important part. We're also looking at different measurements, uh, you know, the waist, hips, um, arms, thighs, things like that. Because sometimes, as you guys know, weight doesn't give you the whole picture. And and quite honestly, I've had clients start to look lean without their weight changing very much. Yeah, the, one of the things that I like to say, especially when we go into a fat loss phase, no matter if it's male or female, it's like we're not really chasing a number on the scale, although that mm -hmm. is a great piece of data. We want to chase a look. Um, and if you're looking and feeling better, shit, we're doing it. We're doing something right. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean uh, that that scale always has to go down. Um, so when do you when do you know or when do you kind of come to that approach where, all right, we've done this fat loss phase for a while. Maybe it's time. Of, hey, we need to go the other direction or maintain this. What is your kind of approach or how do you explain that to a client? Yeah. And so, again, um, I know I'm going to keep saying this a bunch of times. Everyone's different. Um, I generally like to add in some kind of um, diet break phase, uh, whether that's every four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks, depends on uh, it depends on the person. You know, if they're struggling, then I'll probably be quicker to add in a, a, a diet break phase. Um, if they're absolutely coasting and they don't, they're not struggling at all and they feel great. Well, then maybe we'll just kind of keep uh, keep creeping downwards. Um, but like, let's say, for instance, over Christmas break, right? Most, almost all of my clients, I gave them um, a diet break of some sort. Um, some people just didn't track at all, still did pretty well. And I told them the goal was to kind of maintain, don't go nuts. This is not a chance to just eat everything and just ditch all the stuff we've been practicing over this time. Um, and there's some people that said, hey, uh, I don't want to take a week off. Um, I've been doing really good. I feel great. My training is going good. Um, I like the the direction this is going. So for them, maybe they just took like a couple of days. They didn't have a diet break week. They had just had a diet, you know, a couple of days around Christmas where they kind of um, either they didn't track or they did track and just ate a little bit more than they normally would. Um, so, yeah. So again, it's, it's very, it's very uh, person dependent. Approach. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah, exactly. There's so many different ways to go about that. And um so the principles are always the same, but the strategy is different from client to client. Yeah, I think that's the beautiful thing about it. Like we, we all, like you said, we all know where we should be doing or where it needs to be, but it's all about like meeting where that client is and taking that mm -hmm. client center approach. And okay, let's, let's do what you kind of do want to do, but at the same time, keep doing those behaviors that we've implemented in that. Um, so, I mean, I think the, one of the things that I always, from you, you being, a, you know, the, the, the head of education, something that I've kind of dived deeper into lately is that, you know, reverse versus reverse diet versus recovery diet. Um, mm. Can I, can you mind sharing your thoughts on that or if you have any? Yeah, sure. Um, recovery versus reverse. So recovery um, generally talks about like just kind of just increasing those calories, like right yeah. Usually, Boom. from what Boom. I understand, yeah, bringing you right back up to baseline, um, and mm -hmm. then you know the reversal is just slow and steady, like increasing calories. Of the same general principle of a fat loss phase, but in the opposite direction. Yeah, so that kind of touches on um, James Longstrom's uh, study well, with the bodybuilders, right? He did. It, it, it kind of started off as recovery versus reverse, but it kind of because of, uh, again, everyone's different and you can't, it's kind of hard to hold a bodybuilder to a certain intervention that you're trying to implement just because they, you know, they have a lot on the line. Um, it ended up being kind of a, a hybrid. Uh, it wasn't exactly a reverse and it wasn't exactly a, a, a recovery. But um, I would say um, reverse is probably better than just going, you know, increasing 500 calories a day. Um, because when you reverse nice and slowly, there seems to be, not for everyone, but there seems to be um, a, a more positive adaptation. Um, and also too, you know, whether there's fat loss or not, if there is fat loss in a reverse, it's going to be very slow and gradual. Whereas if you go the recovery route and just, you know, add in those 500 calories per day, you might see a lot of fat gain really quick. Um, and that could psychologically screw people up. Um, they might think, oh, you know, I spent six months dieting. And now I've just gained five pounds, you know, what we all know that's not all fat, but that could, I think that could really mess with people. Yeah, I totally agree. I think what that, that recovery diet is going to depend on that individual's mindset, like you were saying, but that reverse, mm -hmm. it seems to be the safer spot. Um, I've just been reading a lot where saying that reversal, it's um, almost harder to, I guess, get that metabolic rate up as high as we would want it to be. Um, mm -hmm. And that it does more negative effects to like, hormonal health and these of that nature. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts because I know you were a part of uh, James's uh, research right there. 
Yeah, yeah. And so, but what's important to point out is that's in, in bodybuilders who are very, very lean, right? And so I think if I remember the data correctly, um, the people who increase their calories more, and again, I think there was only seven or eight subjects, so it's hard to generalize this, but the people who increase their calories the most had the, um, the quickest rebound in a lot of different hormones, uh, leptin, T3, T4. They seem to have a, a, a quicker recovery in that aspect. But again, these are people who are, you know, five, 10% Freaks. body fat, super, yeah. super lean. So that's like a, you know, that's, that's a very small subset of the population. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't try to generalize that to general population just because they, they are so different. Um, we're talking about people who are, you know, trying to fight evolution by, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, being 5% body fat versus, you know, the average client who's, you know, 20 ish, 30 ish percent body fat. Gotcha. No, that's great. Um, something I caught you saying earlier was, right, you, you just like to give a protein and a calorie goal. Mm-hmm. Why is that? Or have you had more success with that? Or what is usually your reasoning behind that? Yeah, so I heard, I forgot who said this, but someone said uh, calories are king and protein is queen. Uh, I kind of like that. I know that might sound misogynistic these days, but um, calorie for, for, for fat loss, um, calories are obviously number one, right? You got to kind of really focus on your calories for fat loss. Um, protein also important for when you are dieting down, um, you want to keep your protein high so that you maintain your muscle mass as you're dieting. So protein is important. Calories, very important, obviously. Um, the reason I I like to give calories and protein only for most people is because it's much, it's a much bigger target to hit, right? If I give you 2000 calories and 150 grams of protein, there is a huge amount of, there's a huge list of foods that can get you there, right? But if I tell you, hey, you know, 150 grams of protein, 2,000 calories, and 55 grams of fat, now your food choices get down to this. If I tell you 55 grams of, you know, maybe 60 grams of fat and X number of, of carbs, so your, your choices get smaller and smaller of what you have to choose from to hit that, you know, dwindling goal, not dwindling, the smaller goal of the smaller target of X protein, X fat, X carbs. And as you guys know, um, Carbs and fats in terms of body composition are, are almost irrelevant. Um, protein is good for maintaining lean muscle mass. Calories are king for um, energy balance and you know, gaining or losing weight. Um, fats and carbs can kind of land wherever they may, depending on uh, the client's preferences and food choices. Again, but there's also the caveat where you, know, you don't want them to be at zero fat, right? We know that fats, you need fat for general health and hormones and things like that. So yeah, so I like to keep it pretty. I think in my out of all the clients I've worked with, I think there's only one person who was who was low enough on fat where I had to mention fat numbers to them. But most people with a regular a regular diet um, get get enough fat. See, one Good. of the things I like about that is your. I'm sorry, I'm having a sneeze attack right now. For some damn reason. <laughs> bless you, man. I keep bless going you. in and out, in and out, in and out. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think the beautiful thing about that is, right, you're allowing the client a lot of autonomy. Um, and I know some clients of mine, man, they just love having those three goals. Um, and it just allows them to develop that pattern. Um, and usually with those individuals, I like to incorporate uh, refeed days. So it allows them to have that autonomy on two different days, um, eat certain foods that maybe are uh, more caloric dense, or just to allow them to feed themselves a little bit more. Um, but I will say I've never really u- utilized what you've done. Um, just because it seems like some a lot of the population I work that they love having those three uh, goals at hand. Um, but I like to use like macro ranges here. Let's plus or minus 10, 15. And if you get within those ranges, hey, that's a dub for me. Um, but yeah, I think I might start trying to utilize that because I remember you saying something on your, uh, your Instagram story. And I was like, man, that's like, again, that allows them to still have that habit of tracking, being more educational on their eating. Uh, but it gives them a lot more freedom uh, throughout the day. Yeah. And you have to, so that's something I do as well is I only prescribe protein and calories for the simple fact that if a body relies on carbs more as their fuel source instead of fats, then, or if that person generally likes carbs more and that's going to create them to be less stressful, then it's per that individual. So it, it might allow their body to be in a better environment to make changes. Yeah. And I think people respond well to flexibility, right? Oh so, yeah, definitely. And, and I've had a lot of clients when I, when that, when I give them just a protein and a calorie goal, they're like, well, what about carbs? I'm like, 
eat carbs, eat carbs, eat fat, eat whatever you want to do. And I think that that it's, it takes a big weight off their shoulder because a lot, you know, there's a lot of part of the uh, diet culture where they, people think they're supposed to have a, a very exact number. Um, I think uh, Adam, to your point about having a range is, a, is could be a good idea. Um, but I, I think people just love flexibility. And I think, you know, I think the, the long-term goal is to get a client to a place where they don't really need you anymore, right? You gave them enough autonomy, enough practice of all these, all these principles that eventually they'll be able to just kind of thrive without you. Sounds like a bad business model, but you know, they do well. They tell people about how they got to that place and then maybe they'll, you know, send refer people your way. Yeah. That's, that's like a, actually an extremely big pet peeve of me. It's like a coach that doesn't want to teach someone to be on Mm -hmm. their own. And it's like, come on, I don't, I don't want to help someone maintain their weight for like 10 years. No, I want to teach them how to lose weight. And Mm -hmm. if, obviously we can't teach them how to gain weight. We can talk about it, but just talking about it and actually doing it educates the person completely different. But yeah, like as fitness coaches, you definitely just got to teach them, educate them on how to do this themselves. Yeah. And I think people love to get, you know, they love to get educated. You know, they're paying you to, they're paying you to be the coach to kind of guide them on how to, you know, reach their goals. But I think, I think people really value the education because uh, you know, giving a man a fish versus teaching a man a fish, right? You can give the man a fish, he'll, he'll eat the meal, but you teach him the fish and they can do it for the rest of their lives by themselves, right? And I think that's kind of the goal. Um, I actually love that reference. I have not, I think I've heard that a very long time ago, but I have never used it. I probably might start using that like all the time now. <laughs> yeah, I believe uh, I believe that's a biblical reference. So and make sure if you have reference notes, just put the Bible on, on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I think, and also too, that's like one of the best feelings as a, uh, a coach is somebody say, Hey man, I don't need you anymore. Like from a basketball coach perspective, it's like, right. We go over practice and put you in game like scenarios, but for me to just sit back and watch the game develop because we've put you in so many game like scenarios and you guys to be able to just flourish. That's the best. That's the best feeling in the world. It's like, now I can just, I got the best seat in the house. I can stand mm-hmm. there and call time out when I want to. But y'all just kill them because we've done this in practice. And now we've done this for X amount of months. Go ahead and flourish by yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I was going to ask you one more question, but to be honest, I totally forgot. Um, but hey, it's Super Bowl Sunday. We've gone for a little bit. I don't have any more questions. Chris, you have anything else for this dog? Man, no. Where do I get that shirt at, though, man? That's <laughs> amazing. I love that. I got it from Lid's Locker Room uh, at Citrus Park Mall. Okay, I'm it, on my way right now. <laughs> dude, honestly, it was hilarious because I, I literally got to the counter not realizing that was Tom Brady's face. And the guy, so the guy, you, the guy's not really a Bucks fan if you didn't realize that was Tom Brady's face, though. No, listen, man, I went in the store and I'm looking at all the stuff they had and I'm like, oh, this is a good old school throwback, right? I mean, that's 95% the old mascot. Oh, yeah, it is. This is the only Tom Brady part is like right here. It's the face, man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, right, highly B. recommend. So um, tell our listeners where they can find you if they're interested in uh, with you and coaching. Tell us where they can, I guess, find you, your, your coaching inquiries and things of that nature. Sure. Uh, on Instagram, I am the exercise scientist with uh, underscores as spaces, the exercise scientist. Um, uh, you can find me on eltmethod.com. That's our coaching page. Um, or you can find me on the world famous uh, All the Smoke podcast. Um, actually, I heard I heard Joe Rogan talking about you guys recently. Hey, you already know he probably talked about the all the all the smoke basketball one, but all the smoke. <laughs> hey, we'll get credit for it. That's why we named it all the smoke. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys. Hey, I appreciate uh, you guys having me on. Hey, man, we appreciate your time and go Bucks for sure. Go Bucks, baby. Go Brady. Go Brady. Go Brady.